Um, so this is a talk I gave, uh, started giving my very last lab meeting uh, uh, in my postdoc lab slash PhD advisors lab, which is Will Cunningham's lab. And I tried to make it just lessons I've learned, mainly from mistakes I made as I was a grad student and a postdoc and a faculty member. Um, a couple of years ago, I got asked to give this as a workshop at APS. So you're going to see like the more kind of smoothed out workshop version. And the goal here is to give you some concrete advice to make your research and teaching more efficient, transparent, and impactful. Um, of course, this is advice, so some of it's not going to work for you or doesn't make sense for you given your research or your style. Um, so you can take it all to grain of salt. Um, I like to think of it as a little bit like an advice buffet, which is um, it's not a one size fits all. Take what things uh, you like and ignore the rest, okay? And apply, you know, you have to use your own intuitions and match with your goals and so forth. Um, but it's also a conversation starter. So I want this to be a conversation. You can ask questions at any time, just raise your hand. Uh, I'll also, uh, maybe Eve can help me monitoring if hands go up from people in the, in the virtual version of this talk. And we'll have a conversation. Whatever we don't get through today, I can do in another lab meeting and everybody is welcome to come to it. Um, I used to give this like every year and now it's maybe like every two or three years, but I realized like a lot has been lost in the pandemic. Um, we used to have a lot better norms. There were more people around to give advice. And I feel like a lot of people have kind of lost out on mentoring and input and, and kind of informal feedback and advice. So I'm realized it might be helpful for me to kind of make it more explicit. Um, the goal here, again, is I would recommend acting like a scientist uh, in many things you do, but also in uh, taking on this advice. So if something sounds useful, um, try it out, collect some pilot data yourself, see if it works for you, see if it helps you become more efficient or effective. Um, and if it's good, keep using it, uh, scale it up. If it's bad, throw it away. Okay, so that's kind of the spirit in which I want to give this advice. I don't want to give it as a be all end all or one size fits all for everybody. Um, a lot of this is going to come from columns I've written. Um, so I wrote, I created a column with June Gruber and we invited Leah Somerville, Neil Lewis and, and Will Cunningham to be co-columnists with us. It was in Science Magazine in the career section for many years. You can go there and I have short columns that are supposed to be advice around tips for giving great research talk, um, how to improve your mentoring, um, how to ace your PhD program interviews, um, how to set good priorities, um, manage faculty job interviews, um, lessons we learned from toxic environments like Dartmouth. Uh, Leah was there, so she kind of weighs in on that. Um, how to navigate social media for early career researchers. Um, a lot of things, this is just like a sampling of some of them, but you can go there and this will kind of deep dive into some of the topics I'm going to cover today. Um, so I don't have time to deep dive into everything. This is kind of going to be more an overview of some of the, some of the topics. Um, the big themes that I've always given in this talk are, first, you really have to take care of yourself to be successful um, in your career. You have to think about the big picture. It's easy to get stuck in the weeds on your research methods, your tools, your measures. Um, your analytics, you have to kind of step back and think of why you're doing this and what are the big, big picture goals that you have uh, for your career. Um, and once you have that in mind, it helps you think about how to build the right skills. Um, I tend to think of skills as superpowers. Skills are often the things that will help you in any career path you go in. So if you build really good skills, you can use them whether you go into an academic career or a non-academic career. Like, for example, statistical skills are highly valued in all spaces. So think about building as many skills as you can in the early phase of your career. Um, the other things I talk about are things like managing relationships, um, figuring out how to build a collaborative network, and those types of things are really important for your success and for your well-being. Um, and then finally, and this is, might be a whole other lecture, is navigating the, the job market, especially the academic job market. So I will probably give that in a second follow-up lecture if you're interested. Okay, so um, many of you know there's a mental health crisis for graduate students. Um, this is this was from a task force in 2004. Of course, it's gotten much worse. Um, this, of course, also is not just about grad students. Actually, I looked it up. The mental health problems of undergrads are actually higher than for grad students. And for people who don't get college degrees are even higher than people who get college degrees. So I think what we're in is just kind of like a generational uh, mental health crisis is probably the better way of thinking about it. Um, it means it's probably more something systemic than something about grad school per se. Um, this is also affecting university staff. And again, this was really at the, I think I, last time I guess it was the early stages of the pandemic, it's much worse, you have burnout and it's massive. And if you go on LinkedIn, you'll realize this is not just a problem in academia. The same problems we talk about here are uh, massive problems in organizations uh, and pretty much every organization. 
And so this is something that is just a life skill you're going to have to think about is how to man navigate your mental, manage and navigate your mental health and those challenges, probably no matter what profession you go into. And it'll probably persist long after you're a graduate student or a postdoc or well, it, whether or not you become a faculty member. These are kind of broader. My point here is these are broader, deeper issues. And sometimes we think of it like I know there's a lot of conversation about mental health crisis for grad students. It, it might imply that something specific about grad school is a problem. It's actually not. It's these are broader issues, I think. Um, it doesn't mean you can't improve grad school, but it doesn't mean that that if you leave grad school, it's going to solve the problem for you, probably. Um, so you're going to have to think about, you know, I, I like to, I'm a psychologist, so I think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, you're going to have to prioritize these. You're going to have to prioritize, and older I get, the more I prioritize things like sleep and exercise, um, eating healthy, socialization. You have to schedule these things in. So this morning, I just came from playing squash with my colleague and I like usually don't come in before 10 because usually I try to exercise every morning if I can. That's like a priority. And then once I get home, I have my kids. And so I'm not really doing almost any work in the evenings. And it's just like I could throw all these things away and be a, you know, a miserable mental health wreck with maybe a couple more publications per year. Um, but I prefer not to. So you have to think about how you're going to prioritize these. And I, I actually schedule these in. Um, why, why it's impossible to get a meeting with me before 10 is because I have my kids so about 8.30 and then I want to exercise and then shower and then come to work. So it's just that's my schedule. I don't really uh, deviate from it unless it's something really urgent or important like a conference or a talk um, or travel. So, um, so those are things I try to prioritize and then I build my work schedule around it. Um, I always like how people have revised um, <laughs> the Maslow's hierarchy. Um, it seems like we're, we carry our phone everywhere with us and we're obsessed with Wi-Fi. It seems like an even more basic need. My kids are obsessed with Wi-Fi now. Um, probably not healthy. Um, so I understand that I have a healthy relationship with social media. There was a point at which I deleted all the social media apps from my phone because it was causing me too much stress. And I like social media and I use it a lot. Um, we're running studies in our lab on the effects of social media on your mental well-being. Um, but there's lots of correlational evidence and some causal evidence that it's not good for you. Um, the social comparisons are particularly brutal for, for, for young girls. Teenage girls are really brutal around body image and stuff. I think they're also brutal for people in our career that you constantly see people winning, like the one that just had wave of which just happened was NSF awards for graduate students. Everybody now announces it and, and it's exciting for them to celebrate, but it can be really stressful if you didn't get it and you feel like you're falling behind. I know I didn't win a fellowship my first year and I all, all my colleagues around me who did, the grad students, I felt like they were way ahead of me or more successful. Um, and so that's just something you're gonna have to deal with um, and navigate that. I know some of our graduate students uh, go off academic Twitter right when they go in the job market because they find it overwhelmingly stressful to hear all the social comparisons and the gossip and stuff like that. And people saying academia is a pyramid scheme and all this stuff is just overwhelming to them. So they go off and they actually are just as successful in the job market and uh, less stressed out. So think about your own thing. Um, we often think of our career, at least I have historically thought of, we end up focusing kind of on the high levels of our needs. Like one of the reasons I went into being a graduate school is because I had previous jobs in government and industry and I was not self-actualized. I could go there and work and get along with people, um, but I found it tediously boring and, and uninteresting and I didn't have a sense of fulfillment. So a lot of what we're pursuing up here is fulfillment in this kind of meaning sense. A lot of us in, in, in our field, um, you know, won't pay, you won't get paid as much as if you went down and worked in like Wall Street. Um, but we do it in part for these other things. But you, but just be mindful that even if you're pursuing it for self-actualization, that you attend to these other more basic needs because the, the way the Maslow's hierarchy is structured is if you don't fulfill these more basic needs, you're gonna have a hard time fulfilling these higher needs. Um, so, um, so you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of research on changes and things you can do um, to help you reduce your risk of burnout. I will say this: one of the most meaningful um, uh, predictors of reducing burnout is actually doing work that you find important. If you're working just as hard for work that's soul killing, um, that actually is one of the best predictors of burnout. So if you're doing something you find meaningful, so one of the reasons why I try to study questions in my own research that I find intrinsically important and meaningful, because um, it actually turns out to be a buffer against against burnout. Of course, if you're really passionate about something, you might put in more hours and neglect other things in your life. Um, so you still have to find that balance. Um, so this is why, I, I, as I get older, I lean in towards um, Marie Kondo's rule of trying to find things that spark joy. I think she actually has a lot of wisdom about that. Um, 
and so a lot of the things we get have the option to do, you have a choice between does it, you know, do you want to do it or not? In, in particular, at, at my career stage, I get this every day, I get asked to do something every day, like a paper, a conference, a committee. And so when eventually as you get higher in your career, you start getting an abundance of options. And so one principle that helps when you're young is kind of doing things that help your career. But at some point, it's also worth having this as part of your decision making, like what things actually give you joy, because there's infinite things you can do, and many of them will help your career in some way. So uh, make sure that you're thinking about that, making up things that you actually intrinsically value and work with people um, you like. One, one thing John Cassiopo told me, um, he was one of my heroes before he passed away, and we went for lunch, and he told me he had a policy of only collaborating with people he actually likes. And I thought that's a pretty cool policy. And so over time, I've cut off collaborations with people who I found were kind of like bad, they were jerks or arrogant or aggressive. And I've slowly weeded them out of my collaborative network and continue to collaborate with people who actually are really nice and cooperative and friendly and supportive. Um, and so you can kind of have these rules as part of how you work and you'll find that as you do it, the work is more sustainable and fun and meaningful and less stressful. Um, so don't be afraid of using these types of rules. I think as your career goes on and on, you'll find these things sometimes are the most important rule. Um, the other thing that I try to use as a principle is thinking about working smarter, not harder. Um, this was from an Atlantic article. I, I saw this analysis of uh, how much professors work. I think it was about 60 hours a week at some university. I posted on Twitter, it blew up, it became a huge whole day debate on Twitter and then it got picked up by the Atlantic. Um, and it became a battle because people were like, I was just posting the actual data, you know, descriptively, but when people see that, they interpret it normatively, that they feel pressure to work more. Um, so so th there's all these debates that blows up about every year on Twitter. We end up having the same stupid debate about it. Um, what I tend to prefer is not working longer, is working smarter. Um, so try like learning things like coding or data analysis will help you work much faster. Use modern technology to work much faster. So in our lab, we've talked about using artificial intelligence to kind of routinize things that are more mundane um, to help us get to the other work uh, more efficiently. And so, or we collaborate. So we work on papers, we divide up the sections, people draft them, then we get together, put them all together. We do it as efficiently as possible to minimize wasted time. So I, you know, and one of, our, one of the cool things about this job is actually it doesn't matter how much you work. Um, because no one's counting your hours, especially now that we have such a hybrid. Like I don't go in my lab and peek and spy on my students and see how many hours they're working and like write it down. I probably go in there like two or three times a week just to say, say hi. And then we have our weekly meetings. Um, what matters to me is kind of how good the work is they do. <laughs> and that shows up when they send me a draft of a paper or give a talk at a conference or present something in the lab. I get to see the quality of the work. And don't get me wrong, you have to work hard often to do high quality work, but if you can figure out ways to do it more efficiently, then you'll get just as much done in uh, much less time and you'll be able to have a better balance in your life. So always look for ways that can kind of make you more efficient in the long run, um, like reference managers. Um, oh, are we going to get this gift work? Yes. Um, this is like, uh, I like to think of how much technology has evolved. Um, this was what my like a office space would have looked like probably when I was like a first year graduate student versus now, because technology has evolved so rapidly. Um, so you can use it to crowdsource ideas. This is one of the things that's nice about social media. I even use this in this lab. A lot of times when we're taking notes, we have a Google Doc that we all share notes on somebody's talk to give them feedback. Or I use it when I teach my undergrad class. I have a Google Doc I give in the first day of class, and all the students in the class of 450 people crowdsource notes. So you don't have to take notes every day. As long as you do it maybe one day in the semester, you'll still end up with this really rich set of, of notes. And so there's lots of things you can do to make your, your work way more efficient. Um, and so don't kind of get stuck doing things the old way. Uh, I also think that this is part of why social media is really cool for sharing research. I actually think like giving a presenting a poster at a conference is really dumb because it takes you two days to put a poster together and then about five people show up and talk to you. Whereas, you know, you could create like a YouTube video in half the time and you'll get a hundred times as many people will probably watch it. So, um, and especially if you have built up a social media following. And so these are the types of things that you should think in the long term make it much more efficient. Um, and so this is why I think like academic conferences have, are kind of, they, they have some function 
but the function is probably not, at least for a graduate student level, sharing your research. There's probably more efficient ways to do it. So if you go to a conference, you should kind of think of what are the things here that I need to do here that I can't do with technology and like social networking for like meeting people face to face and stuff like that. It's actually probably the best use of your time if you're at a conference. Um, you know, and we can look and see like how much conferences have changed in some ways. This is just a bunch of old white guys with mustaches. Um, yeah. And so maybe it's more diverse, but on the other hand, the, the activities we're doing are the exact same. And so in some ways it's still really outdated. Um, and so just be mindful of that. There was actually a great video of this that went super viral a few years ago and it was on YouTube and it was how to create a better research poster in less time. And it, you have a giant, have you seen these at, con this was super influential because now it has a, you have this giant QR code in the middle of the poster that takes up like 80% of the space of the poster. And I remember thinking, the video was super well done. I, I, I was some like grad student in it, I think at Michigan State who did it. And I remember thinking, everybody got excited about this as a way to do posters. I think they missed the whole point of this all along, which was who gives a shit about his advice about your poster? He got 142,000 people to watch his video. So you could get a hundred, you know, this just shows you the impact of creating a clever video is actually where all the impact is. It's not, you know, creating a poster, like he says, with a giant QR code, you still have five people who are going to stop by. Um, so, so the real action is in the creating of the video, not the weird poster format. Um, <laughs> like, here's how it is. It's like, ram all the text in the side, which is really tiny, and then have a giant QR code that takes like all the space. It's like, okay. Um, <laughs> the QR code's good, but you can have that probably in the bottom corner. Um, okay, so the true genius of this video I think is just the number of people who are watching it. And I don't know what it is now. I'd love someone can pull this up and see how many people that how to create a better research poster last time. Last time I saw it was 142,000. Um, okay, so we did this for example, um, and maybe someone could pull up Daniel Yudkin's um, YouTube and see what the current number is. But he, Daniel spent a, you know, a day putting together kind of a video uh, of a paper that we had that came out in JP General and last time i checked in i had over 400 views and he spent less time on this than you'd spend on a poster and he had probably a hundred times as many people pay attention to it as you'd have as a, at a poster so less time spent a hundred times the impact just as a kind of a, a first pass um and so he also of course shared it on social media um his had 70 i mean he did a good job really did a thoughtful thread on it i, I think it was an interesting paper, but, um, you know, you can see even here when it first came out, I had 72 people had shared it, 227 people had liked it. Um, you can post the paper on Psych Archive before it comes out in the journal. Um, last time I gave this talk, it had 957 downloads. <coughs> Again, you guys can let me know if this has gone up more, maybe it, it, it plateaued. And so all these things he did here, all three of these things, the, the, the Psych Archive preprint, the social media thread, and the video on YouTube are all three things that are afforded by modern technology that are far more efficient and different from conferences, right? Because you can present a poster here or here, you know, 100 years, nothing really changed. But, you know, actually a lot has changed. And if we use it wisely, we can get our message out to a much bigger audience much more efficiently. And so that's what's, what Daniel's using. And um, there's also other things that are kind of I've got lots of threads and, and thought pieces on like academic travel culture. Um, it's harmful to the environment, tends to discriminate against women, especially caregivers, right? If you're home with your kids, you can't travel as much. Um, and people from less equipped institutions with less resources, difficult legal situations, travel ban, visa situations. And so there's been a lot of people kind of rethinking the even the value and the, and the kind of the harms potentially of conference travel. Um, I, I've suggested this before that you should, instead of doing a poster, do, do, a, do a social media thread. Um, and I've done this. I actually did a conference that was fully virtual and it was all on Twitter. And each talk was live and you would just tweet out the talk um, and then they just made it one giant thread. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, let's see how many people watched it. So it had 12,000 impressions and 86 people at least clicked on it to to check out like the paper. And so that didn't require traveling anywhere. In fact, I did it while I was commuting to work uh, on, the, on the train. Um, as I said, I crowdsource notes in my class, in my lab meetings. Um, 
my the first time I did this, my class had created 80 single page, page pages of notes. It's also great because then the students who miss class because they're sick or something can just like tap, catch up immediately in any notes they miss. So it turns out to be super inclusive of people who can't be there. It's also inclusive of people who struggle to take notes or can't pay attention and write at the same time. Um, so this is, I, I share tons of stuff. I share all my slides with other people and my syllabi are online. Other people have shared with me, it's super helpful. It's efficient, dramatically um, saves time. So you can think about this. You can, again, this is something nice on social media. I did this when I went up for tenure. I just asked people on social media to share tenure materials and like five or six people shared their materials and helped me write mine. And now I share with people when they ask for it. So I try to pay it forward. Um, I've done it for paper. So one time I was writing a chapter on identity economics for my book and I asked and a bunch of people shared uh, online. Um, another time we created like a lab document. We had a lab meeting on open science practices. So I asked people to like share their lab policies on this and we built ours in part on what other people have done. Saves us from building it all from scratch. Some people have spent a lot of time thinking about this, so ready to help you out. Um, so that's kind of some of the things about um, being more efficient. I, I'm actually gonna open the chat. It'll make this fun. And in the chat, if you have other ideas for using technology or things that you do that could make your work, other people's work more efficient, why don't you share it in the chat? Maybe like take 30 seconds and write one thing that comes to your mind or one thing you've done. Um, you can also share it publicly if there's something that comes to mind. Also, we'll stop and just if there's a question or two people want to ask while other people are typing in the chat. So we can kind of crowdsource ways to do this even better. Okay. No one's typing in the chat. <laughs> um, okay. I'll, I'll let you think about that as I move on. Okay. So it's about being working smarter, not harder, right? Um, so as I said, what matters is the quality of your work and, and its impact. It doesn't matter if you do it the old fashioned way or if you figure a smarter way to do it. Okay, so next let's zoom out. Um, I think it's really important to think about the big picture of what you do. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I noticed from, from students is often they don't know why they're in graduate school. Um, I ask them, you know, why are you here? And often it's not always clear. Um, some of them are just like really smart undergrad students and their mentors encourage them or they had friends going to grad school. Um, but I would think really hard about like why you're doing this, what goals you have for yourself and, and not only for your career, but your life. Like what outcome do you want of this? Kind of what life trajectory do you want? And is this the best place for you? Um, because it might not be. Um, and it's going to be really miserable if it's not because grad school and, and postdoc and, and academia is often full of like, you know, really blissful moments of optimism. That was me. I'm, I'm a pretty optimistic person. And then you get used to being average and you're kind of like uh, motivation level plummets. Um, and then your advisor lures you with visions of greatness, but then you absorb the cynicism of your lab mates, or I would say social media now. Um, then you realize like you have, you know, requirements, qual qualification exams or something, third year papers, you, you push hard, you get that done. Uh, but then you go into a slump after. Um, and so all of these things were happening and we're kind of going through this up and down uh, emotionally and motivationally. So I think if you have a sense of what your goal is, that it kind of evens this out. For me, I have a really clear sense at this point, I've been in it you know, 20 years longer than you, of why I do this. And so to me, you know, a paper gets rejected or a paper gets accepted, my, my mood doesn't change that much. I'm pretty even keel and I don't react that much, which it's kind of sad because it sucks the joy out of when you have a big paper. I remember being my first big paper to get accepted. I was like jumping up and down for joy. Um, at this point, it doesn't really perturb me, but it also doesn't perturb me if something gets rejected um, because I kind of play the long game. I don't really worry about what's happening day to day or week to week um, because I know I'm doing work that matters and I care about doing high quality work. And if it takes more time to get it to high quality or get it published, that's fine. So that leads to kind of an even keel and you can kind of steadily move through things without feeling too dejected or upset. Um, so think about that. Once you have a sense of your goal, you should tell your advisor and your collaborators. I will have students tell me, oh, I decided I, I, I do want to go into academia or I don't, or I want to go to a liberal arts college or business school or an R1 in psychology. It's useful for me to know so I can help give them the right advice for them to be successful. If I don't know what their goal is, 
very hard for me to give them good advice. So the sooner you know what you want to do, the better it is to articulate it. I've also had uh, one of my students, uh, Julian Wills, uh, told me at one point, he wanted to go in academia initially, then after his second or third year, kind of had an existential crisis. And, and then he wasn't sure if he wanted to go industry or academia. So we had a bunch of talks about it. And we decided to pivot his research to social media research. At the time, he was doing social neuroscience and cooperation. And we figured, I said, why don't we do something that builds your skills so that you can go in industry and work in social media if you want, but will also make you competitive on the job market. And so we pivoted his work to study social media. And that was one of the main things that got us moving in the direction of social media and big data, which we now do all the time. We're now one of the main labs that does that. That was all because of Julian talking to me uh, in part, in part, half of it was because Juliet, Julian talking to me about um, his career crisis. And I, then we came up with a strategy to keep all his doors open as long as we could. And then we, then he did an internship and that kind of, he loved it and that pushed him into working for Facebook. Um, and so that was actually really pivotal for me in my own research because it changed what I did in an exciting way, but it came from him being honest with me. And then it, it helped him. He got a job at Facebook, publishing papers, using social media um, and build up his skills in that. And now he works at Google now. So he's really had this really nice career trajectory in part because he was honest and pivoted away at the right time. Um, so define your goals um, and try to also study and teach what you care about. This is also where the Marie Kondo rule um, don't be one of these people who says, you know, before grad school, they're like, I'm going to research whatever I want. And then again, grad school, I'm going to research whatever my professor wants. Then I become an assistant professor. I'm going to research whatever my tenure committee wants. <laughs> then their tenure professor, I'm going to research whatever my grant committee wants. And then they're like this old emeritus, I'm going to research whatever. And then they die. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you got to think as sooner that you can figure out what you want to do, the better. Um, I think that I get miserable when I apply for grants on topics I don't care about, or one of the best advice, piece of advice I got from two people, two of my mentors, when I got my first academic tenure track job, they said, don't actually try to do what your tenure committee wants. Try to do what you think is the best possible work and focus on that and ignore the rest because the tenure committee changes every couple of years. Those people roll out those positions and new people take those positions. Um, and what's exciting in the field, there's certain things that are trendy. Um, when I was young, social neuroscience was trendy. You know, different topics have gone in and out of trend about every three or four years. What, what, what every place is hiring this year is going to be different in about two or three years, I'll guarantee you. Because I've been around long enough to see this. Um, certain things go in and out of vogue. And so uh, what matters is, and this is what advice I got from one of my Cognero professors. He says, what matters in the long run is quality work. And so always be focused on that rather than just trying to do what's hip or trendy in a moment. Um, and, and so do the quality work that you care about rather than just trying to always do what other people want and you'll enjoy it way more. Um, so think deeply about grad school and once you figure out what you want, um, and if you haven't, you should be thinking about that all the time. Um, it, it's one of the primary purposes of grad school, I think, is to, is to have time to think, to read, to take a lot of courses um, and to get a sense, excuse me, of what you want to do. Um, you can pursue something I, either that fascinates you, that's just interesting, like this is kind of like basic science, there's just some things that, bug, that, that are interesting. There might also be things that bug you or irritate you about the world um, that you want to understand why people do them. Um, I end up kind of having both of these directions uh, at times. Um, and I, I found that if you love what you're doing in your research, it will get you through many of the rejections and setbacks, because at least you feel like you're doing something important and interesting. Um, so find what intrinsically motivates you because don't always follow the intrinsic motivators because those are if you're intrinsically motivated the research finds that that's what makes your self-esteem go up and down all the time um, but if it, you're doing something intrinsically motivated you'll have the passion to kind of push through things you won't get as one of many highs and lows um and then and then once you find that be really passionate about it really try to do your best um constantly try to make your research better and more original and more impactful um that's kind of once your goal, your goal, once you have your research going, don't just kind of, I notice some people kind of like get in a, a comfort zone of doing research a certain way. Um, but those research programs often become very stagnant and they often have blind spots that are not addressing. If you start to use different methods over time, you'll triangulate better on what the truth is. Um, but if you just always use the same methods or the same samples or the same questionnaires all the time, you open up a much easier possibility that someone's going to find holes in your work, that the things don't replicate with a different method or with a different sample. Uh, or don't generalize outside the very narrow way that you've been studying it. Um, 
other big thing is, and I know that people I, you know, I admire who are the best thinkers in the field are people who can think at 10,000 feet and zero feet. So 10,000 feet means they can think very abstractly about the high level issues, the theory, um, but they also can think at the level of details and methods and measures and connect those. Some people, there's some people who are really good at methods and details, and there's other people who are really good at theory. The best people are often good at both. They can see the little holes in the methods and also connect it logically to the theory. And so those are the people that I found. Uh, one of my heroes with this was Marilyn Brewer. She was just could go back and forth seamlessly. Um, Rich Petty, when I was at Ohio State, was also a master of this. Some people are just real masters of this. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite quotes. Um, and something that kind of guides my lab ethos is um, boldness is the single most important thing in science, assuming you have the base and talent and intellect and creativity. You know, a lot of people are smart. I'm sure everybody in this room is very smart. You know, every year when you take grad students, everybody comes is smart. Um, people are often very hardworking. If you're, if you got this far, you're probably in the 95th percentile and conscientiousness. Um, and so I think what, what, uh, what he's saying is what often differentiates people then is risk-taking, is boldness, is, is doing something that no one's done before, is pushing the edges of the envelope, is testing a really novel part of your theory, is willing to be wrong. <clears throat> um, so I often think of like what the goal should be is uh, developing research questions that are really risky and ambitious and bold um, that have a very high success that they turn out to be good. Because one mistake I think some many students make, I even see some faculty make it, they start out with a project that if everything goes perfectly, it's going to be a very mediocre incremental finding. <laughs> and guess what? Things won't go perfectly. Your participants won't respond the way you want. Your measure is going to be more noisy than you hoped. Um, there's going to be flaws in your confounds in your design that you hadn't thought about. And so what you want to do from the get-go is be as ambitious as you can when you start. Um, because when it doesn't go perfectly, it will still probably end up pretty good. <laughs> uh, but if you cap your limit on something that is really mediocre, even if everything you, you work really hard at, everything goes absolutely perfectly, three years from now, you're looking at your series of results and you're like, okay, that didn't quite work out so well. <laughs> uh, then it might not be very publishable. People might not be interested, even if it does get published. So you wanna start out being really ambitious at the front end if you can. Um, so set your sights high. Um, and this is where the boldness thing is really important. Um, don't constrain yourself if you, can, if you can't. I'll, I'll say the way I see this is during, uh, when I teach grad seminars, when I get term papers, people send me a term paper with a, a research design study where they ran a soft report measure with an MTurk sample with a bunch of vignettes. I, and I, why would you do that if you're just writing a proposal? Because you could have millions of dollars. You don't have to pretend you have zero dollars. What would you do if you could, if you had the resources? Maybe you'd measure real behavior. Maybe you'd get a representative, diverse sample. Maybe you'd do a really compelling manipulation in a powerful way. You know, so so even at the level of just a return paper, people are already doing something that's so constrained and mundane. They're not doing it in the way that would be the ideal way. They act as if they have no resources, even if I don't constrain them. They automatically constrain themselves. Um, and so don't constrain yourself. Start out thinking as bold as can be and then constrain yourself with, I understand we don't all have millions of dollars, I don't either. And so we have to be constrained once we actually launch a study, but start off bold at what your ideal version would be and then figure out ways you can do the best version of that possible. Don't start out with a really constrained, boring version of your, of your study. Um, okay. Um, so how do you kind of get a sense of what a big question is? Um, some people will, will reject this idea, but I found it's, it's helped me is I have subscriptions to all the top journals in my field, like email subscriptions, and I just glance through them. I see what are the big topics? What are people debating about at the top places? Um, you know, it doesn't mean these journals are perfect. Many of their studies don't replicate or are flawed, but it's a useful way of kind of getting a sense of what are the big, big ideas. Um, one of the other things is it can be very easy to be like, you know, I'm in social psychology, it can be very easy to just read social psychology journals, read Journal of Experimental Social Psychology, really good studies in there, I've published in there, but it often is very narrow, it's just written for a narrow subset of social psychologists who do experimental social psychology. Um, if you start reading psychological science, you're going to realize these things are written for people who are more than one field, 
this isn't just social psychologists or experimental social psychologists. You, these might have an impact with developmental psychologists or personality psychologists or cognitive psychologists because they're all reading this. If you go up a level and suddenly you're in a nature of science or PNAS type journal, now people are reading it who are in sociology, political science, communications, cultural studies, media studies. And if you get something in there, they might read it and be inspired and, and might motivate or change how they think about things. And so you're getting a much economist, you're getting a much bigger impact in those journals. And so it's useful for you to also see what they're all talking about. What are the big ideas that they're publishing? What are the methods they're using? Um, and, and so that's a way to also kind of have your eyes a little bit higher than just like, you know, in, let's say at NYU in our social psychology speaker series on Tuesdays, a lot of stuff is very basic social psychology, which is great the type of stuff you'll see at SPSB. But a lot of times it's not stuff that, that it would be really impactful in other fields. Um, and so it's useful to go to those other talks or read these other journals and see what's going on in those other fields and see if there's connections or insights that you might have that would be impactful. Um, and so that's one way to do it. Um, another thing is, and I, 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 maybe I should draw a Venn diagram here, I think is a way to do it. I think the best ideas are things, maybe I'll draw it here. Um, a lot of what we think of historically in our graduate program, are things that have a theoretical impact. This is like NYU classic, right? Um, that you have theory, and that you're looking for things that are in this theoretical space. Lately, we've changed. Now, when I go to our brown bag talks, it's really about the real world. People are motivated by some real world issue, and they don't really talk about theory in their talks. They're just like, this is a real important issue. People are protesting, or these things are happening in the news, or something. Like that. Try to get in here. Try to get in this sweet spot between practical and theoretical. Make sure that you're making a big theoretical contribution and thinking about something that humans care about. Um, that's where you're going to have what I found in my research um, is going to be the most impactful. It's if you're advancing basic theoretical knowledge and you're doing something that humans are interested in that will care about, that, that policymakers will care about, that people in other fields will care about. Um, and that's often what has generated the most impact. Um, and that's often what's, what the top journals are publishing a lot of the times. So they're looking for things to do both. So think about both. And if you're weak on one, get better on it. If you're really good at understanding what's going on in the real world and thinking about that scientifically, that's great. But really make sure you ground it in theory and you understand what the literature says and that you're making it advance. You're not just saying something that was said in 1974 because you haven't bothered to read the literature. Um, and vice versa, maybe you're really good at theory, but your ideas are really dry. I remember actually Bob Cialdini told me this once at a lunch. He was criticizing Ohio State social psychology at the time, where he used to be. He studied norms and persuasion. And he said a lot of people here study persuasion, and they study it with the stimuli they always use, which work really well, are convincing Ohio State undergrads to support comprehensive exams or not. And they use different arguments, they manipulate everything carefully. And they built this really beautiful theory of persuasion, hugely impactful theoretically. Um, and he says, why don't they just change your dependent measure to whether or not you recycle, reuse your towel in a hotel room? Because if they do that, you will save 100,000 tons of carbon emissions a year. You will be invited to the, give a keynote at the hotel, Hoteliers Association, because you'll save them time and money. You'll get invited to go talk at Downing Street in Congress, um, which he did. These are all things that happened to him. And he's like, I just changed the DV to recycling towels or reusing your towels and has all these other audiences and impacts, even though it's testing basic theory about norms and persuasion. That was a conversation that just burned in my mind. I never saw the world the same way after, after he said that. Um, so think about that. Think about that. What are the dependent measures you can use? What are the weight? What are the questions you could ask to get at your theoretical question? If you're kind of really thinking deeply theoretically, um, so you have to do an analysis of value on your question, you know, try to understand if your research is worth anything and then try to make it worth more. Make sure if you're interested in a topic, make sure it's grounded or advances theory. If you're interested in, in theory, make sure that you're applying it to topics where people haven't seen it before, where it's going to have an impact. Um, I like this. this is, I'm Canadian. So um, this is the greatest uh, team sport athlete in history, in, in my opinion, Wayne Gretzky. He wasn't just the best hockey player. And by the way, I grew up near Edmonton where he played when I was a kid. Um, he wasn't just the best hockey player ever, which he was, but he was way better than anybody who ever was came after. His records will never be broken. 
And, and when he was a little kid, he was small, he was flimsy. He didn't skate faster. He couldn't shoot faster. So they always couldn't, it was like, he was a hard person to figure out why he was so good. And he said he got this advice from his dad when he was a little kid. He says, his dad always told him, go where the puck is going, not where it's been. And I, I always thought this is a really good advice in life. And especially in science is don't always go to what everybody else is talking about or studying. Think one or two or three steps ahead. Think, okay, well, they're studying this. What's the next research question going to be? What's the next question after that going to be? And if you're there, but because it takes, we all know it takes like three years or so, maybe four or seven, five, between you start a study and you have it pop, come out in print, you really have to be thinking ahead of the curve to not get, and in this way, you won't get scooped by other people. When yours come out, it will be kind of like groundbreaking and cutting edge. Um, and so always kind of try to think around the corner. Everybody's talking about this. Everybody thinks about it this way. Try to get it ahead of the game and think, where they, what's the next big question going to be about this? What's the question after that going to be? Um, and so I like to call this the Gretzky principle. Skate to where the puck is going, where the field is going, not where it's been. And some of the biggest impacts in, in psychology have been like this. Actually, remember this, uh, reading this, and I think John Haidt talked about this in his book. He started studying the role of emotions and morality. And I have lots of disagreements about him with this, but um, he started studying this in the 19, early 1990s. And he wrote this big paper in JPSP and it came out, challenged the old way of thinking about morality, which is all about ra rationality and reason. And then he said, it was such a big, my paper is such a big challenge, came out in top journal and no one talked about it. <laughs> He's like, no one cited it, no one critiqued it. And he was so demoralized um, because the field wasn't quite ready for it. But by eight years later, he published a paper in Psych Review in 2001. That paper has been cited, I don't know, probably 5,000 times. By then, he had had other studies and other people who had been reading about it and thinking about it. And then the whole field of morality shifted. And when I was a grad student and junior faculty, the whole world of morality was all about emotions. That he completely had a paradigm shift in the field of morality. Now I think that there was a pushback and there's kind of like a, you know, the questions have evolved from it. But that's what put him on the map. And he told me when he went up for tenure, he actually didn't think he was going to get tenure. And he knows he almost didn't get tenure because they accidentally left the voting in his, his folder that he submitted of all his materials. They didn't vote in the room and he said he got it by one vote. And he was going to leave academia if he didn't get it because he was struggling um, because no one was citing his work. And he got it by one vote and then this whole work took off. And so it was kind of one of those things where he did something that was really novel for the time. People weren't quite ready for it. Um, and so that's kind of something that it's riskier. He had boldness. Um, and so that's something that also like is, but had a massive, massive impact. It's one of the biggest ideas. You know, there was a point a couple of years ago when they would analyze SPSB talks. Morality went from something no one was talking about at SPSB when I was a first year grad student to the most popular topic. And so it completely flipped. Um, so, so that's kind of the thing is like, it's hard to do that, but it's good to kind of think of, he challenged kind of the status quo uh, on that whole topic. Um, and so that was something um to think about is how can you do this so think about what will the reader learn of this article learn about psychology that he or she or, or they did not know um think about that think about why the knowledge is important for the field think about how the claims made in your work are justified by the methods so make sure there's a fit between this ten thousand foot idea and the, the zero feet um these are questions that psych science used to ask when you submitted a paper they made everybody answer these they don't do it anymore to edit or change but i actually like them Actually, at one point I printed this off and put up my lab. Think about this when you're doing something. What will readers learn about basic psychology that they did not know before they read your work? That's a, it's, it's a pretty simple question, right? But think it's actually pretty hard and profound. Can you answer that about the work you're doing? So think about that. Um, and then think about why it's important. Not just that it's novel, that it fills a gap. I think another problem I see in a lot of papers um, and often in our papers too, I used to write like this and, and I still see it in our papers or in the drafts, which is just, we say there's a gap in the literature. Not much is known about this. Well, that's boring. <laughs> not much is known about infinite things. Um, so you don't just want to fill space for the sake of filling space. You want to say, why is it important? Why does it challenge a theory? Why are, why are people going to get pissed off about this? One, one, one question I had in my dissertation defense is, who's going to be mad when they read this work when it's published? And that was actually a really good thing for me. Who's going to be mad? Because I hadn't really thought about that. Are people, are people going to be threatened? Is the status quo going to be shuffled in some way or perturbed or challenged? Um, there's also a lot of writing on this. One of, one of the classic articles on this is Murray Davis's, he's a sociologist. 
he wrote a paper called That's Interesting. And it, he goes through the history of ideas related to sociology and just talks about why they're interesting. And some of them is because they challenge old ideas, create new ideas. Um, and he goes through kind of ways in which things can be interesting. Um, so that's like a good read if you want to kind of get started. Another thing that I found, and I got the idea actually, this book came out maybe 10 years ago, from this book called Blockbusters. And this book made the case that movie studios produce blockbuster movies, even though they don't make much money off of them. I think like the Avengers is like an exception to this, but a lot of blockbusters cost $200, $300 million for a studio, plus enormous amounts of money to advertise. Um, and a lot of them actually lose money. So they're not actually huge profit, profit making uh, thing for studios. Um, so why this, this book looked into, well, why, why would movie studios do this when so many of them are flops or lose money? And what they argued and what they found when they looked into it, Anita Albers is the author here, what she found is that uh, studios produce blockbusters because every so often they hit big, really big, make like half a million, half a billion, a billion dollars. And when they do, the studio gets a global reputation. They, everybody hears about it so that they can recruit better actors and actresses and directors and, and talent for other projects that the studio is producing, it, that it has spinoffs like toys and other things. Um, and so it's worth it because when one hits, it has all these other payoffs that don't show up in box office re revenue. And I think that that, I see that happening with science. If you have a big paper that hits, I talked to Claire about this, I guess is she's here, um, with her big paper. Uh, that just came out in nature of human behavior it's like it comes out all of a sudden she got media interviews she's going to get invited for talks she's getting invited she already got invited to give a talk at harvard and and delaware and people loved it and i and i'm like that paper is really exciting and so it's really gonna create all these secondary opportunities that the average paper won't create and so if you can do something that's on a big question uh, and by the way here's how to make a blockbuster paper Study a big question that's a big challenge to the, to the dominant ways of thinking in the field. Challenge the status quo. Um, have a big study. So one of the things hers is big is it wasn't actually a big question. It was, it, well, it was a classic question, but it was, was not a new question. In fact, someone, when they saw your paper come out and everybody blah, 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 one guy said, I got the same data set, which was publicly available, found the same thing and thought it was boring. And didn't, didn't really, <laughs> um, but what was interesting about it was it was the biggest and best test of it in history. It was 220, 220, 22,000 studies that were analyzed in one paper. Um, and, and so it blew up in part because it was the most, probably the most definitive test that will ever be done on that topic or close, at least up till now. Um, so big, big power, or in this case, also many studies. But you can do many studies. You can do five or six studies. Um, I think that's also, uh, Steve had a big paper in PNAS. It was about 3 million people were analyzed. I think that was why also it blew up. It was like, it's pretty definitive when you have huge samples like that. Um, another thing that matters is better samples. So we know that we have a weird problem, Western, educated, industrialized, what's the R stand for again? Rich, democratic societies. Um, and so a lot of our samples are based on convenient samples. Historically, actually been university undergrads and intro psych classes at probably 40 universities that were mostly in the United States or Western Europe. Um, that's where most of the literature is based on. So get a richer, more diverse sample. Collaborate with people in other countries and other places and other communities and find out what those people think and see if that can actually challenge some of the ideas. Um, there's actually a really interesting paper on this that, um, well, there's lots of interesting papers on this, but th there's a classic paper on this in BBS, Brain and Behavioral Sciences on the weird problem. Um, use more incisive methods. So a lot of people settle for convenience methods. Like I keep saying, they use self-report measures or they use vignette studies. Um, try to go beyond that. Can you measure real behavior? Can you get somebody in a real interactive situation? Um, those things are gonna be more incisive rather than having people imagine themselves in a situation and then self-report what they say. We know there's problems when people imagine and say things. <laughs> there's like 50 years of research on the problems with self-report measures, actually probably about 100 years on that. Um, and so if you're going to measure socially sensitive topics, you probably shouldn't use self-report. If you're going to measure, um, if you want to generalize to real behavior in the real world, you kind of realize people's reports to vignettes that they're imagining being in the real world often very different. So try to get real behavior. Um, Use multiple methods. This is something you can do across studies or across papers. 
is so it is okay to use a vignette study, but then follow it up with a real world study. Is it okay to use self-report? Follow it up with an implicit measure, a real behavior measure. Um, look at real behavior that matters too. So also dependent measure that matters. One like voting. Voting really matters. Can you move around voting in the real world? Um, that's hard to do. Can you move around vaccination behavior? We have a vaccination problem in the world right now and in this country. Um, there's all these important behaviors that you should try to study. And if you study them, you might, people will listen to you. Recycling, we've talked about Cialdini. His work on just reusing your towel if you're in a hotel for a second day dramatically saves the environment and saves millions of dollars for hotel companies. You save money and companies will want to come, they'll pay you to come talk to them, you can do that. And you'll help the environment in a profound way that you would never otherwise do. We actually, in our, in our big climate change study that we're doing with Madeline and Kim, um, one of the things we have is a tree planting behavior. We just spent $50,000 this week to plant trees around the world because that was our dependent measures that do effortful behavior to plant trees. It's cool because we measure real behavior. And guess what? Real behavior does not look at all like self-report in this, in this data set. Around the world, 50 countries, um, people's behavior does not look like their self-reports. Different things drive behavior. Different interventions work on behavior than self-report. Um, there's actually no partisan bias in behavior where there are huge in beliefs about climate change. So we're finding huge differences in behavior versus self-report. And the behavior matters because we can, we'll can we have more impact on the climate with this one study than we ever I ever will probably anything else I ever do in my life. So it's really cool because now you do something that helps the world. Um, so that's going to be, that's one of the most things I was excited about that project. Or you can get real world data. We, we now do this with social media data. We can scrape and analyze real world data, real behavior, people expressing things in the real world. You can get apps, daily diary studies, so many things you can do. You can get an archival data set. This, we live in a world where there's more data available to you than ever before in human history. And so what that means is that the opportunity cost of not analyzing it is higher. That the, the, the value of doing a lab study is much lower than it ever was in history, in the history of, of social psychology. Because you can easily get, like we got, uh, I mentioned Claire's paper, we got access to this huge data set from Upworthy, from a website that was giving their data away to people. Um, so we got it and analyzed it. Um, so instead of us running eight studies on negativity bias, we just got one data set and it'll be more impactful than eight studies ever would have been. So that's why you should really look into real world data and get at your hands on it if you can. Our paper will be more impactful. It was probably easier to do and cheaper for us, cost zero dollars. And so it didn't require a grant or anything like that. So if you're a grad, if you're a grad student, man, what a, what a benefit. You don't have to have all this giant grant money. Um, and then the social impact's higher. One of the reasons I think our paper took off is because journalists love it. Journalists wrote, an, uh, you know, one journalist wrote a piece in Atlantic on it. Of course, guess what? It's all about journalists. <laughs> um, it's all about communications. And so people in other fields and in that space really resonated with them um, because it affects how they do their work. So that's the other thing that ends up being the social impact and this conversation changer. Like one of the journalists who wrote about it said, oh, there, this is important to understand how negativity bias is used in media. It actually can manipulate people and distort representation to the news and that's bad. Um, so he wrote a great piece that probably was read by hundreds of thousands of people. Um, Okay, so think about these things. Go down this list. If you wanted to screenshot one slide, this is the one. Go through your research question that you're passionate about that sparks joy for you, you know, that Maria Kondo thing. And now look through all these things and see are there ways you can make it better, more blockbuster by doing these things. Um, so make your research question more rigorous and unique. Um, think about the methods and paradigms that you're challenging and, and using. Think about your sample. Um, you know, this is something that's very common if you go to Silicon Valley, like this is the mantra there. Um, this was like Steve, Steve Jobs, of course, created the template for this is innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. That this is, this is how you make your work innovative. And this is what, you know, helps you become a leader in your field, if that's what you want to be. Um, you don't have to be. There's lots of people who do incremental work or important methodological innovations. I don't want to diminish that. But if you want to be a leader, if you want to kind of be disruptive to Silicon Valley lingo in the field and challenge the status quo, th this is the type of stuff that, that often goes into it. Um, or to borrow the uh, quote from Meatloaf, um, may he rest in peace, if it ain't broken, break it. Um, that you don't have to go along with the kind of status quo. I keep saying status quo because it's partly, this is the ethos of this type of way of thinking. Um, of course, I also want to uh, you know, there's a great paper by Mazreen Banaji, one of my favorite chapters of all time, where she wrote 
about all the ways in which she had beliefs about implicit bias and how she had student after student who disagreed with her and proved her wrong. Um, and so she wrote this great, great book. John Jost actually was a, was a co-editor of this book. It was on perspectivism, which is a philosophy of science. And it's really about um, seeing both sides of an issue, the yin and yang. So spend time thinking about why you're wrong. Um, think about when you might expect the opposite of what you expect. Um, um, try to imagine it perspectives on a topic that could make a prediction that goes the opposite direction of your hypothesis or what the what the field believes. And this is a really useful mental exercise to kind of evolve your thinking and not get stuck thinking the same thing. Um, and I, I really res this this perspectivism really resonates with me. It comes from Bill McGuire, who is a kind of a philosopher of science, uh, one of the greatest social psychologists of all time. He wrote about perspectivism and this was his ethos. He was constantly trying to think about how he was wrong or think about fresh perspectives on ideas. And, and it wasn't just, he didn't spend time thinking about how everybody else was wrong, which is also what I've been arguing you should do. Think about how you're wrong. <laughs> Once you have a perspective, imagine the holes in it. Imagine what critics might say. Um, and that will help you design more creative, innovative studies. It might help you evolve your theoretical thinking. Um, Cause then you can design the right studies, see boundary conditions, limitations, samples where your idea doesn't hold. So I always like to be the first person to prove myself wrong to find a, a hole or a flaw um, and evolve my thinking. Um, of course, as I said, I've been pushing you towards boldness, uh, like V.S. Ramachandran uh, proposed, but not all scientists pursue risky paradigm changing ideas or should. Lodge a, a lot of major discoveries are made possible by frameworks laid down by careful incremental advances of their peers. So it's okay to have these big ideas, but I also think it's useful to be incremental, especially once you actually have an idea that you're doing, be design follow-up studies that nail it down. Try to understand the boundary conditions of it. Um, so, so it's good also to be programmatic. Like I, I think one mistake also you can make is you have 10 different lines of research on 10 different ideas and you never make deep progress on any of them. So you also want to make sure that you can be programmatic. So try to get an idea that's really exciting and bold, but then try to be programmatic about how you study it. I think that's kind of like the yin and yang approach, I like that like perfect balance. Um, and so this can be based on a psychological process, I said based on theory, or it can be based on something practical, some phenomena that you're interested in in the real world. Um, I think if you want to go into academia, it's also used to be programmatic because eventually you have to give a job talk. And in a job talk, which is an hour long, you have to present a program of research on a topic and ideally what people want to know is that you are an expert on something and you've thought deeply about it and then you've run a series of studies helping you understand it. And so that is something that's really essential for a job talk. If you have five different papers on five different topics, really hard to give a good job talk. <clears throat> so, so that will be held against you at that stage if you just do that. You can kind of be all over the place, all over the map, a little bit scrambled. So you really do want to have that big idea, but ideally you also want to be programmatic and rigorous about it. If you, if you want to go in academia, if you don't, who cares? Um, but just kind of letting you look over the horizon at what is evaluated and, and what's seen as, as high quality science over a long run. It's the same when you go for tenure or when I just went for promotion of full. They want to see that you have a program of research that you've made deep progress on. Um, and, and in many fields, that means a book. You know, in psychology, some of us write books, not everybody, but a book is hard to write because it means you have to have a lot of research and have thought deeply and read a lot about a topic to fill 300, 400 pages, whereas like short articles are five, 10 pages. And so if, if you, by the time you get to tenure or full professor, at least could write a book on something, that's probably the level of depth that you want. You don't have to have that when you go for a job, um, but maybe think of it by the time you've got tenure, you would have enough material to write a book on it if, if, you, if you had to. It's probably a good way of thinking about it. Um, to go for a job, you probably want to at least have a couple chapters of a book. <laughs> you know, that's what that's why dissert, that's what a dissertation is. Um, of course, with dissertations, now we have this the thing at NYU where you could staple together a dissertation with three papers. Um, if you're going to do that and they're in different topics, try to think of how they're connected. Um, I was just talking to somebody about this. Oh, oh it's actually Ariana who has a job interview. She has kind of two lines of research. And so we were talking a lot about how to weave them together in her job talk. And so even if they're slightly different, can you find a broader theoretical framework that binds them together and shows that you're making deep progress on a broader theory? So that's kind of the challenge for her to do that. So you can do that. Um, okay, another thing, 
Um, this was a debate I always had with Diego, my former student. Um, he always thought that quantity mattered most, and, he, and you can measure quantity. If someone gets hired at a job, you can count their papers. Quantity is easy to see. Quality is really actually hard to see. Um, but when we read people in our last job search, we had a job candidates, we read their materials, we read their papers at the last stage, and we all rank ordered them. And then we looked and our ratings were highly correlated about what counted as quality. They're correlated about 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So once we actually read the materials and read the paper, we could distinguish stuff. You know, and this was by the, at the, the first pass was on quantity. So you'd have published a couple first author papers to get past, to get on our short list. At that point, we read the materials and we read, started, and at the last, last stage, we read the papers. And so the first stage, there's a quantity kind of cut off. You have to have done some work for most jobs. Um, and there's different cutoffs for different schools. But once you get past it, then there has to be a quality that people can read and see. Um, and so one thing that I often say to grad students, you know, grad students want to publish, they feel pressure to publish, so do assistant professors. You know, everybody knows the old saying, publish or prayer, or actually, publish or perish. Um, my professor, when I was at University of Alberta, says publish or prairies, <laughs> um, because she was in the prairies. Um, so, so, um, so zero papers is bad, right? You're not going to get an academic job or a postdoc if you haven't published anything. Um, but this was advice I got from my advisor was just publishing a lot of stuff that's really mediocre. It hurts you in the long run because people are eventually going to sit down and read it and won't be very impressed. Um, whereas he always thought if you have two excellent papers that are truly innovative, that that hints at excellence. Whereas 10 mediocre papers proves mediocrity beyond a doubt. It's a lot of evidence of mediocrity. At least if you have a small number of excellent papers, it hints that you have a very high ceiling and great trajectory. And, and top places tend to care more about that. They want someone who's going to do really excellent work. Um, depends on what job you want, though. If you're interested not in an R1, but maybe an R2 or an R3, then probably what they care is just you can publish. It will matter less to them the quality of the papers. So understand that this, there's going to be different standards at different, different schools. Um, I think when I went to the market, I had two first author papers. And, and that was our cutoff for our last search. So you had to have two first author papers. Um, OK. Um, quality of journal is people use it as a heuristic of quality. Um, it's not a clear index of quality, in my opinion. And now we have Google. We can look on Google Scholar and see if papers are being cited, even if they're not in top tier journals. Um, and so it's easier to get that information now than it used to be. And so um, the impact factor of the journal is kind of one heuristic people use, but it's not the be all end all. And now people have other ways of looking. And of course, eventually they're going to read the papers. If you get to the short list, they'll read them. Um, so I'm now kind of also talking about the job market a little bit, just kind of giving you a sense. Um, okay. Um, as I said, publish or perish is a, is a bit of a misnomer. Um, publishing for the sake of publishing is not the goal of science. This was a mantra that my advisor, Will, always drove into my head. He said, the goal of publishing is not to get another publication on your CV. <laughs> the goal of publishing is that you've done some interesting research and you've done it well enough that you are ready to share it with other people. It's dissemination, just like if you give a conference talk. Goal of giving a Thomas talk is not just sit up and spew empty air out of your mouth. It's because you've done some series of studies that you think are important and relevant to the field, and you're ready now to share them with people because you think they'll be useful to people. And so he says we kind of lose track when we think of publishing as, a, as an end in itself. It's a means to an end. It's a way of communicating to scientists that scientists will read. And it's also a way of getting feedback on your work from peer reviewers. So don't always just focus on publishing for its own sake. Um, this was a, a thing I had when I was a grad student. I wanted to just get some publications out. And he's like, that's not good. He's like, I don't even want my name on that if you submit that. <laughs> um, and that was when it struck me. I had papers with Smith that I kind of run on my own with his advice. And at that point, I was going to submit a journal. And then I thought twice when he took his name off. And I said, oh, yeah, I actually don't want to publish something that would be embarrassing or have reviewers and editors see something that would be embarrassing. So I actually think of it more in terms of that sense. Like, I don't want to be it. So I take my paper, my name of several papers a year because people put me on and sometimes in other labs. And then I'm just like, that's fine for you to publish, but I wouldn't want to be associated with that. I'm not convinced by it. I don't think it's strong enough or important enough. So, so you have to have your own internal standards. And then the journal usually has a separate higher standard. Um, so publishing is necessary to advance science, but it's not sufficient. If you publish bad work that's not replicable, that has holes in it or flaws or is fraudulent, um, that can harm your career more than help it. And look at during we had the whole replication crisis, a lot of people who were big deals in the field, their stature plummeted. Some of them did not get tenure. Many of them left the field. Um, 
that was bad for a lot of people because they had published a lot of shoddy work for a long time. And some of them had gotten big names at top universities, but eventually people came up with more modern ways of evaluating the work and following it up. And if it's not solid and it's not replicable, you're building a house of cards that eventually is gonna crash down. So, so I was lucky to learn this when I was young. Um, my advisor was very like, did not want to publish crappy stuff. And his advice, he came from labs where that was the norm. Um, some labs try to be like, uh, they'll publish in fake journals. You know, they'll publish anything. Um, that's not something you want to be associated with if you want a career in science. Um, so just, it's better to have a long view. You're also early in your career. So your view is longer than mine. I'm a lot closer to retirement than, than you are. Um, so you want to have a long view of it. Um, and I like this quality over quantity thing for lots of lots of things I do. Um, I generalize this philosophy to everything, like mentoring. When I started as a grad student, I had all these undergrad RAs, and then I couldn't mentor them. I became a really bad mentor. And even in my own lab, at one point, I grew to seven graduate students. I realized I can't be a good mentor to that many grad students, so I've shrunk my lab. Um, I I skipped all the main conferences I go to this year. Um, SANS and SPSP and CESP, which I normally go to, I got invited to give talks at all of them. I turned them down because I have too many other speaking opportunities. And so it's too much for me. I can't be around the lab. I can't focus on my research. I get burned out. And so you got to focus your efforts on a couple things a year that matter to you. They're going to be impactful. Um, at your stage, I would say yes to a lot more things. Eventually, you're going to get asked to do more things than you can handle. And that's when you have to start saying no to more things. So your ratio of yes to no's should be high when you're younger and early in your career. And as you start, like you should start a lot of projects when you get going, but once you have them going and you want to write them up, you don't want to have too much that you can't write it up and you're just bottlenecked. And so you don't want to have too much going on that, that messes you up later in terms of your productivity. It doesn't help you out. Um, I also learned this in teaching. Um, I used to try to ram as much content as I could in a lecture. I found that making my lecture shorter with a couple key points and making them more interesting was Students love that more and they remember it more and their marks go up. Um, so it was a win for everybody to actually like try to cover less content in my lectures instead of trying to ram everything in. And again, I'll, I'll use a Steve Jobs quote. He has actually, he was an asshole, but he had some good quotes. Uh, <laughs> um, so I don't have any of his asshole quotes, but um, I thought this was a good thing. It comes from saying no to a thousand things to make sure we don't get on the wrong track or try to do too much. It's only by saying no you can concentrate on things that are really important. So you got to think about what those things are important. That's why I said, find your intrinsic motivators, find that things that give you joy. And that's the first thing you need to do so that you can learn later what to say no to. Um, and we even wrote an article on this, um, not only learning when to say no, but how to say no. There are, are, there are ways to do it that are polite, that are respectful, that help people, that you can recommend other people whom, like for me, I get asked to do something that might be an exciting opportunity for someone else. So I recommend my collaborators, my, my students, my postdocs, um, as you know, you guys get lots of invited stuff, um, is I recommend you because for you early in your career, it's a really big opportunity. You have the bandwidth to do it. Um, a lot of times it's your research. So, so you can recommend people or you can just simply say, I don't have the bandwidth. I would love to do it, but I'm, 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 I'm out and people respect that. Um, okay. So you can always, other thing you can do, this is advice I give often in my lab when people are meeting with me and I ask them to be on a project. I often will say, don't answer me now, take 24 hours and think about it. Because I don't want them to feel pressured by me to say yes for to do something they don't want to do. So you can do that to yourself. If you get asked to do something you're not sure about, give yourself 24 hours or a weekend. You don't have to respond immediately and say yes, because that is a rash thing to do. Give yourself time to deliberate. Um, here's a good heuristic I learned. Ask yourself, would I be willing to do this next week? And if you're too busy next week, probably say no, because guess what? Your schedule is going to look like that six months from now or a year from now. It'll be just as busy as next week is because eventually it's going to be next week that you're going to have to put this thing together. Um, and so that's a good heuristic. Would I be willing to do this next week or two weeks from now? If not, say no. Um, and also think of the opportunity costs oops, of all new tasks. You're essentially, every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else or dropping the ball on something else. So only do it if it's if the value of it's higher than all the other things you're doing. Um, so the things you can do is be kind and reasonably prompt in saying no. So take that 24 hours to think it over. But then if you're going to say no, just say no. Don't say you can you can say I need a little bit more time, but don't just drag it out. Because they need someone to do something or want something to do. It's helpful for them to know clearly if you're in or out 
And if you're in, be all in. Um, like I said, recommend somebody else who's qualified or, and might want the opportunity. Don't recommend somebody else for something that's terrible. But if it's an interesting opportunity for somebody else, recommend them. Um, and also I do balance this out. Don't say no to everything. You should be a good member of your community. If you're submitting papers to journals, you should do reviews. You should probably do two or three reviews for every paper you submit because you're asking other people to do the service of giving you feedback for your paper. So you have a duty to your community. If you're in this department, you should do some service or leadership because guess what? Other Because having a great community is a public good. I give this talk as a community service to you all um, because I want to have a great program and department. I want everybody here to be better and successful. So I do things like that to help everybody else out. Um, so you should probably do one thing each year, one service role. You don't have to do eight of them or you don't have to do five of them, but you should do your share to put in what other people put in to make it a great place for you. And that's how you have a great community if everybody chips in. But there should be some equity here. It shouldn't just be one person does everything. Um, and then this will help you. Don't make the mistake I made in grad school by spreading myself too thin. Um, I did too many lines of research early on, so I now encourage my, especially early career students, not to do too much. Um, you know, I, I like to do, it's easier to opt into something than to opt out. Once you opt out, you're waste, you wasted everybody's time because you got a bunch of people to help you do it and then you drop the ball in it. Um, so have a couple things going, but don't have too many things going that you start dropping the ball on your main things. I often say for first year grad student, get at least one line of research going once it's going really well and you can run the second study and it's replicating then start your second line of research and then when that one's going really well you can start a third but don't start too many too soon or you'll drop the ball in all of them and you have you have benchmarks you get your first year paper second year paper third year paper dissertation proposal you have to hit those on time frame because your funding runs out so you don't want to also sabotage your future self don't sabotage your future self. Be, be nice to your future self. And then we won't go back to the first slide on burnout. <laughs> so think about your, what would make your future self happy um, and successful and flourishing. Um, this is especially hard if you're doing interdisciplinary work. I talked about how being interdisciplinary is impactful and exciting. But if you do, are using methods and theory from multiple fields, you're going to have a harder job because you have to read multiple fields. Um, and you run the risk of getting lost or doing bad science because you don't know what you're talking about. So don't spread yourself too thin because you end up doing uh, lower quality work. You know, you end up like this Mad Libs where you don't know who you're working with or who's paying you or who your advisor is or wh what your field is. Um, so my opinion is focus on one or two lines of research where you are the lead and then maybe collaborate on one or two lines of research where you're a junior collaborator but not responsible for driving the paper and project. Um, Ideally, multiple lines of research should cohere around a big question. So again, you should have some vision, some high level thing you're working towards, and all of it connects to that vision. Um, and then don't expand to new projects until you have control of at least one line of research, or you're ready to drop one. So one line of research, uh, you have a line of research that's kind of stagnant or producing a bunch of mixed or null effects, you can drop it and move on. I think actually some people stick with a failing line of research too long. It's also, that's some cost fallacy is the name for that. Don't get sunk cost fallacy. Just because you run a study doesn't mean you have to keep doing that line of research. If the study comes back terrible, that's some, you use that information, you're a scientist. Update your priors about that theory or hypothesis. Another thing I think you should kind of manage your research, like a hedge fund manages its risk, or you manage your stock portfolio for your retirement, which eventually you'll want to retire. If you want to retire and, and have money in your retirement, you will be told, have some bold high-risk stocks so that's for you, bold, high-risk ideas and projects, but have some bonds that are low risk and producing incremental positive outcomes for you. And it's really the balanced portfolio that is, man, maximizes your long-term success. The logic is the same here as every financial advisor you'll ever talk to. Um, when you're younger, they'll also tell you this with your stocks, you can take more risks, right? When you're younger, they'll tell you you're going to have higher risk stocks. As you get older, like my parents' age, they, all their money's in bonds. <laughs> because they're, they can't afford the stock market to go down and lose all their income at their age. And so when you're younger, you can take more risks. Um, and once you have a high risk project that's doing really well, a couple high risk projects, you can take even more risks because now that one high risk project becomes a, a, a very low risk because you know it's paying off good dividends. And then you can add other high risk things. Um, so, so try a couple high risk things, get them going. If they're not going, then you're gonna to have to get more incremental because you're gonna need something that you can defend for your dissertation. Um, okay, we're almost out of time. I'm gonna say a couple last things. 
try to have a coherent research program. Um, it's good to kind of have this top-down approach, that's theory. You know, a lot of the labs in our program, you know, construal theory, all the predictions flow from construal theory. That's a top-down approach. And, the, and then Yakov's lab has multiple lines of research. You have to be careful though with that because you can become very paradigmatic in your thinking. You could start looking for confirmatory evidence for your theory. Um, and then you can become more rigid in your thinking if you follow your theory too much. Um, and that can turn, and we have research in our department on motivated perception. You can start seeing in your, mic, in your complex data patterns that you want to see because you have a theory about what you expect to see. And, that, and that, so you also, it's useful to have the ability to have multiple lines of research that are more open or creative. Um, and and this, this is a great quote from uh, Asimov who said, the most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discovery is, is not Eureka, but that's funny. And this is me, when I have data that shows something weird or funny, often that's when I get most intrigued because it means my thinking was wrong and I have to evolve my thinking. And if my thinking is wrong, it might also mean the field's thinking is wrong. And maybe there's gonna be something that's gonna challenge existing frameworks or thinking. And so I, my research, many times I've had this where I found data and had multiple ways of data come out and it came out one way and it changed my thinking. Actually, that's one of the ways I ended up going down the social identity rabbit hole is because early on, I found that that was driving most of my effects. <laughs> um, and, and it couldn't, it didn't have to be, it could have been other things that were going on. And so I actually think, again, a hybrid here is useful. I try to balance having a programmatic theory driven research with more bigger exploratory studies. Um, and, I, and I try to listen to the data uh, as well as the theory. And, and the ideal here is thing let theory evolve. You're, if your theory, uh, this was Tessa's, Tessa's mentor, in grad students, he was an old, old person in the field, Dave Kenny. He said the thing that he thought was really bad is a lot of people he knew from grad school from 30, 40 years ago, he, he would say they're still defending their dissertation, that they got stuck on something in their dissertation and had not left or evolved from that in 30 years. And he always thought that was pretty pathetic, meant because he was a data guy. He was always like, you got to listen to your data. Um, and so you have to be careful that you're not just defending your dissertation for the rest of your life. Um, so be, you know, it's good to be analytical and critical, but also you want to be creative. You want to discover stuff. That's part of what's exciting about science is these, these, hmm, that's funny moments. Um, and so don't always spend your career trying to take people down. Be open to anomalies. Be open to your theory being wrong and having to evolve. Uh, try to connect disparate ideas. You know, there's always like you get a bunch of data. Um, there might be a pattern there. If you look carefully enough, you might be able to connect the not dots in a way that someone has not. Um, and this is why ideas don't always come from just like reading journal articles in your field. You know, some of the best ideas come from taking a, well, me actually taking a shower. This is from uh, PhD comics, but it comes from talking to somebody, going for a walk, just sitting around, thinking, letting your mind wander. That's often where your brain is connecting those dots. It's not always just from doing something the same way every day in a very stereotype, rigid kind of way. Um, and again, at the end, you have to have a research statement on this. If you want an academic job, you have to have a job talk. And so you should, if you have multiple lines of research, you got to be thinking about how they cohere. What's the, what's the narrative? What's the story that you can tell if you give a, a, write a research statement or give an impressive job talk? And you want to have the long view, right? It's good to be audacious and, and bold, um, but it's also important to conduct ethical science. All these guys are, are data fraud people. Um, this is Stoppel. Smeesters and Mark Hauser, who was at Harvard, these people end up being like stories in the New York Times because they uh, cut corners, didn't take the long view, they didn't listen to their data. They tried to prove a theory based on, and they couldn't, their data didn't support it, so they started manipulating the data. That's why you gotta listen to the data. The, the worst thing you could do is have a theory where your own data says it's wrong and you double down by pee hacking or cherry picking or or data fraud because this ends up being you why would you do that why not just be like oh you know smeesters could have just or um smeesters and Stoppel could have realized a lot of the social priming stuff was bullshit because their data was telling them it was bullshit instead of waiting for their application crisis and them getting caught in fraud to tell them they knew first they could have been the first ones to blow the whistle on that field and actually probably got highly cited papers and been actually had their scientific esteem go up instead they got kicked out of the field i don't even know what they do anymore and so it kind of reminds me a little bit of like Lance Armstrong. You know, he was at the top of the world for a while. Um, then all his titles stripped. He went from a hero to a complete, uh, you know, like a parable of failure. Um, so you want to have like rigorous approaches. 
you want to avoid these nine circles of scientific hell, like p values and inventing uh, p phishing, which is p hacking, getting rid of your outliers for for dubious reasons. Don't do this. And if your advisor wants you to do it, just don't do it. Tell them that you actually don't believe the theory or the data contradicts or design another study that pits your idea against theirs. Um, be transparent. Commit to open science. Commit to sharing your materials and your data so other people can scrutinize it. Commit to pre-registration, which is what we do all the time now. Um, and there's all these guidelines now for improving psychological research. I don't need to go through it. You're kind of the generation now that's used to it. My generation went through like warfare about these things. Um, but we have to have more uh, in, uh, integrity. And this is now expected at all the top journals. They require you to make all your data public. You know, they have pre-registered report sections, including at the R paper I just mentioned was a pre-registered report at Nature Human Behavior. And so you can do the most rigorous approach and you're taking the long view. You know, when I was young, I used to care more about publications, you know, and eventually I learned that that, that changed. I care more, as I get older, I get more excited when I think a paper's exciting or good. I think when a colleague emails me to compliment a paper that they read, just had that uh, the other day, they read one of my papers that this is really excellent, um, really re appreciate it. Another lab replicates our paper or our analyses, or someone cites your work. Those are the things that matter. And so you have to think to yourself, like we're all in this, uh, again, this was a, a metaphor my advisor told me, is that grad school is a lot like a delay of gratification task. Um, you already know it is financially, right? You could be making more money in industry, but you're also delaying gratification with your research. You know, you get this creative freedom, you get to be your own boss, you get this job stability, you get to the other side, but you have to kind of have this long-term approach to be what's gonna stand the test of time and look most impressive to people kind of down the road rather than just always just being stuck trying to get through this week. Um, okay, so uh, this was supposed to be a digestion break, but I'm gonna let you digest this for a couple weeks. You can think about it, you can talk about it, and then we'll come, we'll do another one of these skills workshops um, in a couple weeks, probably about three, four weeks, so I'll announce it. You all can all come back, bring more people if you want, and then we'll talk about skills in the, in the job market.